Hello, everybody. My name is Pablo Wojciechowski. I'm a faculty member at Northwestern University and the director of the Center for Latinx Digital Media. Thank you so much for joining us for today's weekly virtual seminar of the Center. It's truly a pleasure to have you with us. The mission of the Center is to create knowledge about digital media in Latinx and Latin American communities across the Americas. Today's speaker is a leading scholar in this space. Hector Beltran is assistant professor of anthropology at MIT, and Tomas Guarna, a graduate student also at MIT and an external affiliate at the Center for Latinx Digital Media, will introduce Hector in just a minute. I'm delighted to note that this quarter our series is co-sponsored by the Alice Kaplan Institute for the Humanities, the Buffett Institute for Global Affairs, the Center for Global Culture and Communication, the Department of Communication Studies, the Department of Radio, Television and Film, the Latina and Latino Studies Program, and the Program in Latin American and Caribbean Studies. But before we go into the seminar, I would like to start by acknowledging that Northwestern is a community of learners situated within a network of historical and contemporary relationships with Native American tribes, communities, parents, students, and alumni. It is also in close proximity to an urban Native American community in Chicago and near several tribes in the Midwest. The Northwestern campus sits on the traditional homelands of the people of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Ottawa, as well as the Menominee, Miami, and Ho-Chunk nations. It was also a site of trade, travel, gathering, and healing for more than a dozen other native tribes, and is still home to over 100,000 tribal members in the state of Illinois. It is within Northwestern's responsibility as an academic institution to disseminate knowledge about native peoples and institutions' history with them. Consistent with the university's commitment to diversity and inclusion, Northwestern works towards building relationships with Native American communities through academic pursuits, partnerships, historical recognitions, community service, and enrollment efforts. Let me say briefly a little bit more about how the seminar will unfold. First, Tomas will tell us more about Hector's research and career just in just a second. Then Hector will deliver his seminar, and after that, we will open for questions. Please enter your questions in the Q&A function of the webinar at the bottom of your screen at any point in time. Tomas will moderate. At the end, we will deliver some closing remarks. Once again, many, many thanks for joining us. And without further ado, Tomas, the screen is all yours. All right, thank you, Professor Wojcicki, for introduction. And it is an honor to introduce Hector Beltran, who is Assistant Professor of Anthropology at MIT. Uh, before this, he obtained his Bachelor's of Science in Computer Science and Engineering from MIT, and his Master's in Folklore and PhD in Social Cultural Anthropology at University of California, Berkeley. He was also a UC President's Postdoctoral Fellow at University of California, Irvine. And Professor Beltran's two paper about hackathons in Mexico explore how the technical labor of computing, code work in his terms, intersect with state narratives of technology and progress and with issues of identity, class, race, ethnicity, and gender. There are deep, there are deep explorations of what being a hacker means, escaping from universalistic understandings of hacker ethos or hacker culture, and recognizing the, the specificity that these terms have in their own particular localities. So in this sense, there are rich contributions to scholarship and culture of, cultures of computing of Latin America, as well as other contexts beyond the global north. So please welcome me, uh, join me in welcoming Professor Valdran. Thank you so much, Tomas, for that warm, wonderful introduction. A uh, special thank you to Pablo for the invitation, Mora as well for helping set up and coordinate all of the logistics, which were perfectly streamlined. And it's a pleasure to be here sharing with you all my work. Let me share my screen here. Can someone just give me a thumbs up that you can see them? I think you can see them. Great. So it's a pleasure to be here sharing part of my book in progress, tentatively titled Code Work, Hacking Across the U.S.-Mexico Techno Borderlands. And what I'll be sharing with you today is from a chapter of that book called Making Latinx Makers or Prototyping Latinidad at the Migra Hack. Before the San Jose region in Northern California transformed into a high-tech Silicon Valley, it was the Gold Valley, the Mercury Valley, and the Fruit Valley. In his book, The Devil in Silicon Valley, Stephen Pitty traces these transitions from
from a Spanish settlement in 1776 to the late 20th century. Pitty uses historiography to place labor relations at the center of the development of these valleys. My interest is not in a valley of silicon or fruit or gold, he writes. My interest is in the valley of people shaped by race for centuries. Pity finds that these valleys have one thing in common, workers whose labor is shaped by the logics of racial capitalism. The history of San Jose region is thus shaped by a devil of racist ideologies, which take different forms and operate under different guises. By examining the history of these valleys through the lens of working class Latinas and Latinos, he highlights the power that race has had for structuring the political and cultural developments that accompanied the rise of this Silicon Valley. But non-white residents of these valleys were never nearly victims of the devil. Low wage labor and fiscal hardship morphed alongside the vibrant political activism that has defined the region for more than 200 years. Intersectional, transnational, cross-generational movements of accommodation and resistance of working within and against have manifested themselves subtly and dramatically across time as people find their place and are placed within the racialized labor economy. Anybody who has participated in any sort of political organizing understands that these boundings and presentation of particular groups of people involve difficult compromises and many times essentializing strategies aimed toward particular ends especially when it comes to political or economic integration. Those from within know that the movements from below are often the result of shifting tensions within what to an outsider might seem like these neatly bounded communities or groups. Pity shows how Latinx community has been divided along class lines as a new white collar Silicon Valley elite encouraged entrepreneurship and self-determination for racialized Mexicans urging them to wake up and leave their so-called culture of poverty, all while promoting this very culture to influential politicians. In one vivid example, he describes how this new white collar elite throws a local fiesta complete with ethnic imaginaries and stereotypes and invites politicians aboard these party floats that are part of this fiesta, but few working class Mexican migrants or Chicanos are invited to the fiesta, much less aboard the float following current discourse and practices that make up the hiring practices of Silicon Valley companies, perhaps they weren't the right fit for this fiesta. Taking this simple but representative example of exclusion, some might say that the folks who weren't invited didn't want to be there anyway. If we go down this line of thinking, we can talk about policies, politics of refusal. But for a moment, let's imagine that the float represents economic opportunities and political representation. Regardless if one wants to participate or not, a classic stance from advocates is that they or we should have the option to choose. The claim here is that the invitation should be there and that we should decide what to do with it. A phrase comes to mind, the misery of being exploited by capitalists is nothing compared to the misery of not being exploited at all. That quote usually attributed to economist Joan Robinson. In my own ethnographic research within the tech domain, in the code worlds and the hacker worlds, I frequently think about these invitations, the invitation to become something different, something new. In this case, under the guise of becoming a coder or a hacker, a maker, a techno entrepreneur, of becoming someone who can not only get aboard this float, but also develop the tools to build it, the tools to destroy it while those techno elites are on board, the tools to rebuild it into a float of a completely different kind. In other words, I focus on spaces that promise to empower communities to become the makers of the very tools that have been used to marginalize them under the guise of technological innovation. Hacker and maker spaces that promise to help young people carefully cultivate the technical competency to repurpose technology for means other than those for which they were intended. So what I did in my field work, um, I spent a lot of time deep hanging out, as some people would call it, in hackathons, mostly between 2015 and 2019 in both Mexico and the US. So a hackathon event 
um, functions as an ideal research site to examine these types of invitations to explore the construction and management of differences in relation to these hacker, maker, entrepreneur identities. Highly ephemeral, but also highly public and visible. These events allow privileged access to understand how these different communities crystallize and evaporate. Because at these sites, people are busy with their code work, but also with self-identifying as hackers, I explore how participants align these practices, personas, and hacker imaginaries with a particular group or cause. So during, the, during these years when I was doing field work, there were a lot of firsts in these hackathon worlds. The first women's hackathon in Mexico, the first Latinx hackathon in Oakland, California, the first hackathon where US Latinxes uh, came together with Mexicans to work on X or Y cause. My work explores how making within these sites becomes entangled with the making of a particular people. Today, I'll focus specifically on constructions of global Latinidad through a series of hackathon events named the Migra Hack that took place in both the US and Mexico. These Migra Hack events were aimed at bringing together self-identified hackers from both sides of the border to think about rela uh, issues related to US-Mexico relations, border securitization, and immigration. Popular discourse thinks about racial diversity within these maker and hacker groups by proposing ways to get different or diverse participants to join events aimed at empowering their communities. Here I'm interested in how members of racialized groups are called upon to construct and manage these differences themselves in relation uh, to these maker and hacker formations. How do differences become important as hackers differentially position themselves, but also align themselves with the contradictions of treating code work as racialized, classed, and gendered labor? And here I'm thinking with uh, different scholars who have explored variants of this very question ethnographically. Sarita Amrute, thinking about Indian uh, software developers in Berlin. Um, Lily Irani, focusing on innovation and rethinking design from India and the global south more broadly. And Sylvia Lintner, most recently thinking about dimensions of hacking and copycat culture from China. Essential to the hackathon is the prototype. Across my research sites, I saw a lot of prototypes, a lot of stuff being made. If you want some numbers um, that sort of represent the magnitude of all the stuff that was made, there was an organization that decided to enumerate the stuff of, stuff of hackathons around 2016, the year when I was doing my research. And they came up with the following numbers. 3,450 events organized, 200,000 participants, 13,000 prototypes created. This was um, from the hackathons they were able to extract you know, these numbers from across the world. That's a lot of prototyping. I follow anthropological work that takes seriously the prototype's function as a preview of things to come, as a demonstration of what has been worked on, but is always itself a work in progress, always open to suggestions and ready for renewals. The expectation is not that one will complete a polished working product, but that teams within the space will present to a panel of expert judges their works in progress, a preview of things to come. This methodology stems directly from software development processes where developers release beta versions of their programs, receive feedback from users and other developers, and use this information to iterate on their designs and implementations. In order to get closer to a final design, to approach a product or a project that might overstep its prototype stage and be ready for a public. The stage at which the prototype is released varies uh, project to project. It might happen very early or very late in the design process. Very early might be when you're still seeking input from users with uh, mock-ups drawn on a cardboard, a piece of cardboard. Very late might be when you're adding the final bells and whistles to a digital version of the project that's almost ready to be launched. Indeed, a hallmark of open source code 
is that it is technically always in beta. Releasing any version of your code is an invitation for others to contribute code that might add their own features to your program or even contribute code that might re-implement a feature or contribute more robust or elegant code um, developing the same feature. The principles of simplicity, consistency, efficiency, and reuse are core tenets of computer science and metrics used to identify a talented computer programmer or hacker. Similar to the spirit and ethos that filled other hackathon events, participants at the Migra Hack filled the space with contagious excitement. They were here to discover the potential of new technologies, foster bargaining collaborations, and resolve pressing societal problems. The event's aim was to get folks with different but complementary abilities together for a weekend and have them use technological tools to create projects or prototypes of projects that might visualize data, tell stories, propel citizens into action. For many in attendance at this Migra Hack, it was our first time attending a hackathon. As publicity for the event succinctly stated, most journalists and community members have never been involved in a hackathon. Most programmers have never been involved in immigration issues. Migra Hack brings them together. Monica, an executive professional of a media company that publishes newspapers and websites in cities with large Latinx populations, encapsulates much of the vision and enthusiasm of the event with her comments. Hackathons are remarkable in that they bring the power of technology, programming, engineers to think about ways to solve social problems and combines it with journalism and journalism that focuses on the immigrant community. If we can pull the data and not just tell stories from it, but then provide people solutions and to force accountability, I think that's what's so, so powerful that comes out of this. This smaller scale, more intimate experience distinguished itself quite explicitly from other hackathon events in that the participants were there not only in the name of creating innovative solutions to abstract societal problems, participants were there to address very specific problems and politics they were familiar with and that affected them on a personal level. The hackathon was not of the standard make the world a better place variety that are easy to criticize and categorize as idealistic or naive. Participants at the Migra Hack had arrived with a mission to empower communities they felt a close connection to, and in the process empower themselves by, dividing into, by diving into the code, perhaps with a broader vision to become the empowered coders of tomorrow. Cindy, who worked for an immigrant and refugee rights organization, was eager to respond to the call. A lot of the work I've done has focused on advocacy around immigrant rights issues, so I was hoping that coming here, I would meet other people who are interested in similar issues as I am, but also in creating a solution to the problems that I've seen, she says. Just as folks who have been working on immigrants', immigrants rights issues feel naturally drawn to the space, so do the software developers who have always felt close to the technology, such as Antonio, who tells us, I've always been interested in immigration issues and it's always been something that's very close to me. Naturally, I've always been into technology. To a certain extent, I'm doing what I feel I'm supposed to do. It's something that just, I feel I'm driven to do it. From the outset, this event seemed to have a more participatory feel to it than the other hackathons where I had conducted research. One might say that there was an unspoken commitment to make sure that everyone who wanted to participate was actually able to do so. This was also evident in the very structure of the event. A full day was devoted to workshops where participants learned new technical skills and vocabulary in order to be able to scrape the web, access relevant immigration data, manipulate data sets, and visualize newly acquired and cleansed data. After participants met, exchanged profiles, and indulged in the excitement in the air, they were ready to get down to the making. They had to. Like other hackathons, the clock was ticking away. In 48 hours, they'd have to use this newly acquired data sets and tools to develop a technological prototype aimed at raising awareness or helping resolve an issue related to the migrant population, issues many of the participants at the event 
felt familiarity with. The prototype could be a vision for an app, a platform, a video, a visualization, or some other creative media genre. Among the participants were also veteran programmers who joined the newly initiated hackers to create projects that used open data to tell stories about border militarization, immigrant detentions and deportations, migrant access to healthcare, and retained belongings at the border. For this latter project, for example, the team was composed of members of a nonprofit which documents human rights violations within US immigration centers. Their aim was to bring attention to a violation that occurs, occurs frequently at these detention centers, but that's rarely discussed, the retention of whatever meager belongings have survived migrant journeys. Migrants are frequently unaware that they can ask for the return of their belongings, so they often get deported without them. Team member Blanca tells us they cannot get jobs, they risk being arrested for not carrying official identification. If their relatives send them money, they can't make the withdrawal in the bank. And if you ask the favor to someone else, they run the risk of being stolen, of the money being stolen. This project, which used an animated video to convey this data to the public, received honorable, honorable mention at the Mexico City Migra Hack event. On the other side of the border, in a place far removed from the geopolitical line that separates US and Mexico, but where people are fully aware of these border issues, the, win the winning Finding Care project at the Chicago Migra Hack used data from the Affordable Care Act to visualize unequal access to healthcare. To make their pitch even more compelling, they combine this data with the story of a 24-year-old undocumented Chicago migrant who needed a kidney transplant. This project, along with many of the videos, animation, and data visualizations that were produced at the events, correspond to an emerging form of participatory advocacy media that's not, not just about the issue, but also about a particular campaign aimed at resolving the issue. With this issue to be resolved, carefully articulated, Many of the apps and projects at the Migra Hack event resembled this genre of advocacy media that's explicitly non-neutral and refuses to provide a closed narrative or structure. The intention is to invite audience members to meet the victims, to become aware of gruesome facts, and most importantly, to act. This media uses techniques of audience engagement to tell concerned citizens how to get involved, who to connect with, where to sign up. The panel of judges at the event clearly had an eye for this form of media advocacy as they commended this Finding Care project with the following text. Coherent, elegant narrative with lots of points of departure, triggers questions for further research, polished production and short time frame with simple effective data visualization. Would love to see more calls to action, links to advocacy groups, reporting on pending legislation, and so on. Despite the call for more audience engagement, more explicit calls to action, the judges commented that nevertheless, uh, this was an effective and elegant visualization, and more importantly, on the team's ability to develop the project in a short time frame. In the hackathon world, it's not unheard of for hackathon participants to show up to the event with already made prototypes, often in pre-organized teams, ready to win prizes. So the fact that this team actually met within the event and was able to produce this project was something to uh, highlight and commend. The real idea behind any hackathon thus is to produce this working prototype, this MVP, minimal viable product in startup uh, language in a limited time under the constraints that mimic Silicon Valley style free market cycles. The time pressure is not lost on any of these hackathon participants, and it's reflected in their underlying feeling, in their desires to stay ahead of the game, to catch up, to not be left behind. As an example, Cesar, a journalist in attendance at the Los Angeles Hackathon, tells us, como, uh, translation English here on the slide, como periodista no puedes dejar de avanzar. Este hackathon nos permite explorar técnicas utilizando las últimas tecnologías y modelos que antes quizá no habíamos considerado. Fernando, another hackathon participant, tells us, we have to provide more opportunities like the Migra Hack because they provide access to people and expertise. 
They create an environment, a very welcoming environment in which to explore what for many people can be intimidating. You know, the world is moving at a very fast pace. And if we don't catch up, in fact, it's not about catching up. We need to start leading. These general themes or fears of staying ahead of the game, of staying current, of not being left behind by technology were frequent across my interviews and also in the media portrayals of the event. Popular media reports in particular picked up, picked up on the diversity aspect of the events, praising the organizers for putting together a structure that allowed those who would not normally show up to the hackathon to attend and to become immersed in the code worlds. The reports praise the participants for taking it upon themselves to learn new skills and to participate. At the Migra hack, it was clear that what was being made overstepped the boundaries of the projects at hand. What was being made were mindsets, hopes, futures, and participation models and subject positions to occupy these futures. Each instance of the prototype of the socio-technical configuration manifested as an object to come becomes a potential vision of a way of organizing society as a whole and the place of community and individuals within that society. Prototypes are by definition incomplete. They invite makers to work on completing the object. It's an invite to complete the object at the same time that it's an invite to complete themselves. Analogous with design thinking and thinking with your hands, hackathon rules encourage participants to have fun, break rules, and to create new objects as well as new selves. The prototypes that emerge at the Migra hack are not only aimed at improving society, in this instance by approaching issues related to immigration and inequality, but are also aimed at constructing a new way of looking at the world in which individuals constantly remake and improve the world and themselves. From interviews and participant observation, it was easy to see that event participants came with genuine desires to improve themselves and society. It was also clear that they were interpolated as subjects who want to participate, who want to improve themselves. Although the events were not marked specifically for Latinas and Latinos, many of the participants indeed identify as Latinx. In this sense, participants are not only performing their increasing Latinx maker status, but also their ability to exercise their entrepreneurial subjectivities to construct, mobilize, and manage their own Latinidad. I'm interested here in what Latinx prototyping means in the context of this idea of Latinidad. As Jonathan Rosa reminds us, in its joint articulation alongside prevailing forms of racialized difference, Latinidad is more than 500 years in the making, yet always on the demographic horizon. Rosa proposes that Latinxes are presented in a racialized social tense of the always not yet, or perhaps the never quite yet. So how do we reconcile this perpetual incompleteness of a people with the always in the making of the hackathon prototypes? Fell fast, fell often, is a common phrase that circulates in the hackathon worlds. The phrase indexes this fast-paced, disciplined risk-taking that is carefully honed at these events and which quite explicitly comes from Silicon Valley or California ideologies. Throughout my research, I encountered what I call these politics of making and not making, that the failure of these prototypes and the failure of the teams was expected. That is, most everybody knows that nothing really becomes of the startups or the projects beyond the hackathon itself, and that teams many times just shake hands and say goodbye when the event is over. This is expected not only by the organizers, but also by the participants. A recent study published in the ACM Technical Symposium on Computer Science Education looked at around 12,000 of these major league hacking events, these very popular events, between 2018 and 2019, and saw that 77% of the code commits happened in the first week, but only 7% of the projects had any activity after six months. Empirical data, uh, this is really just empirical data to show us kind of what we already know, that there's very little sustained development of these projects. In any case, 
participants at the Migra Hack showed up with the vision for advocacy and future calls to action, an ethos that mirrored the discourse of the event organizers. As in this quote, the results, apps, stories, graphics, maps, and friendships, it's powerful, it works with training and mentoring, open data is an opportunity for all. But the event participants don't necessarily expect that their apps will be completed or that their budding friendships will last too long. Indeed, the only feasible way they could really fail is by not being at the event at all, by not becoming the participants and by not taking advantage of the possibilities that this opportunity presents to participate. Scholars of this participatory condition argue that participation has evolved into a leading mode of subject, subjective interpolation in our contemporary period. Participation is construed as not only a concept and set of practices, but as the promise and expectation that one can be actively involved with others in decision-making processes that affect the evolution of social bonds, communities, systems of knowledge, and organizations, as well as politics and culture, especially with new media technologies that purport to create these egalitarian technical infrastructures and modes of engagement where everyone can participate. Participation becomes desired, expected, and ultimately normalized. Not to participate is seen as strange and disappointing. The non-participant becomes suspect. As MigraHack attendees build their prototypes over the weekend, they fulfill this promise and the expectation to participate, that one can be actively involved with others in decision-making processes that influence the construction of social bonds, communities, systems of knowledge, organizations, politics, and culture. These scholars use the term participants who cannot participate to reference the material reality of a class of citizens present in Aristotle's classic formulation of citizenship, whereby slaves and women belonged to the household, but were excluded from the administration of justice and the holding of office as a condition of the possibility of participation by Greek male citizens. If the construction of a class of active citizens is constructed in relation to a class of excluded citizens, participants, who cannot participate. Migrahak attendees avoid their structural exclusion by materializing their subject positions as participants who wish to participate and participants who can participate. In order to claim a place in this latter category of active, concerned, technical citizens, of participants who can participate, Hackathon attendees must not only be able to replicate the discourse of the event, and we see in the quotes I presented here that many of them were able to do so, but they must also perform their technical understanding and capability, their hacker ethos, as well as their hacking abilities. At the Migra Hack, the newbies who come to learn new skills and vocabulary, data mining, mapping, fusion tables, in order to be able to scrape the web and access relevant immigration data, join these more experienced users who update their technical repertoire with workshops on new software to cleanse and visualize data sets. As the workshop day comes to a close, Rafa, another journalist by training, enthusiastically tells me, coding is actually not that hard. It's all about reusing stuff and something someone has already done that hard and someone has already done that hard part for you. You don't have to understand everything to add a new layer to the program. Rafa and other participants at the event have picked up on what it means to navigate the computing stack. In order for them to put in the code work, they must know how to not only infiltrate the black boxes of code, but move efficiently and elegantly between them as they organize the stack using coding design principles. Indeed, the participants seem to have aligned themselves with the hype around the event. Particular groups of people becoming empowered by not only using technology, but also by actively participating and building the technology that they use. Media scholars have proposed similar visions, specifically for marginalized populations, in which active technology users can take control of their future by populating the present social imaginary 
with fully empowered subjects of a future imaginary, especially for populations that are framed as being stuck in the waiting room of history, their members can use technology to create stories, characters, and epistemologies through which these groups can articulate dreams and aspirations in order to create a future imaginary at the same time that they become present in that future. Here, I'm drawing specifically from the work of Jason Edward Lewis, but also from other native scholars who have grounded studies of new technologies in perspectives of community empowerment, thinking about how marginalized populations might appropriate technological infrastructures for their own ends to resolve problems that are pressing for their own communities. The Meet a Hack formation might be said to be fulfilling such a vision of the Latinx community coming together, appropriating new technologies, and using them to resolve issues they have decided are important to their collective well-being and future livelihoods. In this case, matters that evolve around, revolve around borders and migration. Jason Edward Lewis provides a more critical perspective, however, by reminding us that any technology has underlying configura configurations that are hidden from the average user, many times from the not so average user. He proposes that to fully make technology speak for us, we need to be proficient at navigating the different layers of the stack. The stack here refers to these interrelated and interdependent layers of hardware components and software protocols that make high level computations and programs possible to move from the bottom of the stack or machine code to the top of the stack, programming languages and systems means to traverse the corresponding circuits, microchips and computer code that can each be part of these different layers of abstraction that make up the system. Edward Lewis proposes that in order for indigenous people to completely infuse their worldviews and future aspirations into the system, they must, become in, they must become adept at navigating all layers of the stack only by fully and comprehensively participating in this way can we increase our ability to make the technology speak in the way that we desire. While I share his vision, it's an ambitious one that necessarily calls for education and training, whether it's formal or informal, but that involves focused attention and practice that can take months, years, generations, certainly more time that is provided in the space of the hackathon or several hackathons. Indeed, a common, common scene at most hackathons is uh, where the burden of actually implementing a working prototype falls on the expert who has claimed his authority. And I say his there on purpose because it's usually a male identified participant. Many times these pre-configured teams arrive at the event in order to maximize their possibility of winning the event. And when that isn't the case, um, when teams form themselves, um, regardless of the particular skills they had to contribute to the project, an expert programmer is usually the one responsible for implementing the working project. At the Migra Hack, as participants attempted to transition from novice to expert, there were several people occupying mediator roles attempting to help this apprenticeship model for empowerment move along to its full potential. In fact, it was more common than not to encounter these mediators and an underlying aura of congeniality at events aimed at empowering a particular group or determined to resolve a relevant social problem. The vision to develop proficient technology users, those who might be able to traverse the distinct layers of the computing stack in the short span of the hackathon, however, proved to be more idealized fantasy than implementable vision. Similar unviable apprenticeship models abound in other maker and DIY spaces. Following the work of Christina Dunbar Hester here, she shows us how activists promote their vision for self-sustaining participatory structure, one in which self-guided discovery and learning might provide a heightened sense of agency to participants, where the demystification of technology can lead to a leveling of expertise. The vision here is that as time progresses, novices will become experts and that the field of experts within the group will increase, broadening the capability to recruit more novices in a self-sustaining novice to expert model. What we find instead are moments of frustration and alienation where novice participants experience frustration when they attempt to learn from these experts responsible for building the prototypes in a compressed amount of time. 
Although activists self-consciously try to distance themselves from competitive and exclusionary aspects of some electronics and engineering cultures, the technical pursuits are overwhelmingly fun for a few, especially men, and intimidating and unappealing for others. As Dunbar Hester tells us, the burden of participation falls disproportionately on women and technical novices. While this participatory promise and its on the ground structure of participation varied in contrast across my research sites, I encountered similar dynamics where the burden of participation fell on the novices and the burden of implementation fell on the technical experts. So as I transition here into my closing, I wanna just highlight a few key points I've att attempted to make here and bring us back to pity and this devil in Silicon Valley. Through all my work, I've claimed that these hackathons are not so much concerned with what is really being made because most of the time it's not really made at all. At events like the Migra Hack, what is being made oversteps the boundaries of the projects at hand. What is always being made are mindsets, hopes, futures, and participation models and subject positions to occupy these futures. The very openness of the maker interventions are embedded into the structure of the tools and the making. At the Migra Hack, attendees construct new descriptors for themselves, participatory, collaborative, engaged, concerned, and of course, hackers and makers. Being by definition incomplete and open, the prototype encourages participants to work on completing the object. Although the events are not marked specifically for Latinxes, many of the participants indeed identify as Latinx and are drawn to them because of the issues they have come to resolve that are deeply personal to them. There's a lot at stake here. Their Latinx maker status, as well as their Latinx maker status. It's all up for grabs. Migra Hack's mission to bring the power of technology together with programmers, journalists, and concerned community members in order to resolve complex migration issues is quite powerful. Participants are invited to learn to open up the black boxes of technology and in the process learn about the code work it takes to move between them. It gives them different tools to think about how the racialized politics of migration really work. If scholars have identified advertising, radio, and language as domains where Latinidad is constructed and contested, when people are asked to become Latinx cultural producers, here I argue that hacking and corresponding making are domains that are just as important in the negotiation of Latinidad. I don't just mean that the hackathon should be another site, another domain where we think about Latinx identities and difference. More generally, my goal is to think about Latinidad and constructions of race in spaces where difference is more subtly marked. By focusing on the newcomers who attempt to join these code worlds, who are themselves inspired by calls announcing that anybody can participate, I'm interested in roles that hierarchies of expertise and participatory models play in the renewal and completion of a people. If prototypes are by definition incomplete, how do prototypes contribute to Latinx's perceptions about their own incompleteness? How do hackathon and maker spaces make a group of people take responsibility for their own becomings and give them a way to manage their own racial and ethnic markers. This is especially important when considering, again, coming back to Jonathan Rosa's Latinidad, reminding us in its joint articulation alongside prevailing forms of racialized difference, Latinidad is more than 500 years in the making, yet always on the demographic horizon. Latinxes are always not yet and never quite yet. Rosa investigates these constructions in the context of a Chicago high schools where students are pulled into the project of becoming the young Latino professionals. At the hackathon, young people are invited to become the new coders of tomorrow, the makers who can make and use technologies that can be used to turn systems on themselves to perhaps reshuffle the corresponding racialized hierarchies. So I started the presentation with Pity's work on the history of Silicon Valley because it gives us some context on how these so-called opportunities are recurring. Those invitations to join on the success of practices and technologies of the Gold Valley, the Mercury Valley, the Fruit Valley, 
most recently this Silicon Valley, hackathon being one of its related manifestations. But of course, the Valley is by no means governed by a single ethos, although the, this idea of Silicon Valley has come to represent techno-entrepreneurialism and high-tech capitalism that has shaped a set of conventions concerning the branding and packaging of ideas, toolkits, and ways of working and participating around the world. The most comprehensive diversity in tech efforts propose that underrepresented groups achieve real inclusion by becoming fully immersed at all layers of the coding stack, that they become the full stack developers of the code worlds. What might it look like to become the full stack ethnographers of tomorrow? Researchers who can work with participants to develop our own co code work aimed at decoding the logics underlying each set of new becomings, stereotypes, processes of racialization, without forgetting about history, learning to navigate the code worlds at the same time that we decenter, sorry, that we center the power that race has had for structuring the political and cultural developments that has accompanied the rise of techno entrepreneurship, that shifting devil that Stephen Pitty writes about in his book. The vision is that continued collaborations can inform and also benefit from a hands-on, but also critical anthropology or media studies. So we might be better prepared to negotiate with this devil, at least in Silicon Valley and its corresponding cultural mutations. Thank you for your attention. And if you want to continue to think with me, here are some representative recent journal publications. Thank you, and we can open it up to discussion and questions. All right, um, great. thank you for that fantastic presentation. And I'm gonna take priority of the, of the first question, but um, if any of our attendees have, have any questions, please leave them in the Q&A. There's a small, a small button that says Q&A in the, in the toolbar here. You can leave your questions there. Um, and I was wondering if you could expand more about the differences in disciplines. So you've mentioned that in the hackathons, there's advocates, technologists, voters, and journalists. And I was wondering if, if you could expand more about kind of the discipline boundary work between those two, um, between those roles, and, and if hacking becomes something that is more transversal, or, or if it's only about the actual prototype making about the coding. Yeah, can, can you repeat that last part, Tomas, where you said, does hacking become something that's more... Sure. So if hacking becomes something that is, you know, beyond the, that division of roles or, or if it's something that's more specific to the actual coding. Good. Yeah. Okay. So first of all, so, th so this Migra hack was one set of events. So I went to, um, you know, dozens of hackathons in both the U.S. and Mexico. And you know, part, part of, the, of the ethnographic challenge and the empirical challenge is they're also different. What is there to say about the hackathon and all its different manifestations? So I'm really focused on like what draws people to these spaces uh, that center hacking in whatever manifestation. So in this Migra hack, it was um, particular that it, it was it was aimed at journalists specifically, at least some manifestations of it, because uh, there were also very events. It started in Mexico City, went to LA, went to Chicago. There were there was one I went to recently was in Denver, and it wasn't so much geared toward journalists specifically. But in the sort of slivers of, of the event that I presented, some were aimed at journalists specifically. But I think the general call that I tried to present here is that newcomers should come, right? Like, hey, even if you're not competent in coding, like, don't be afraid. Uh, people will, will work with you and you have your own kind of set of skills and expertise that you can contribute here. So, um, you know, does hacking kind of, traverse like something else is in the coding. I, I think in theory, that's the idea of the event that anyone will come and, and be able to contribute. And, you know, I, I'm interrogating that a little bit with these participatory models. Like, is that really the case? What really happens in the spaces? Um, so we have to approach it from different ways, thinking about like, what are people actually hacking at the end of the day? Or what, what do they think they're hacking? Um, and it kind of, it, it, it works as, as, as a shiny object in a sense, this, this, this term hacking, you know, I feel like more recently it's, 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 it's kind of overused term in some ways. And I, you know, I'd be willing, I'd, I'd love to hear what other people think about this, but it kind of like brings people together 
but then people have such different conceptions of what that word really means. Um, but in terms of getting people together, I think I think it's important. Maybe, maybe part of the question or what I'm hearing is, what are what are the possibilities? And something something I talk about in the code work article, or I tried to argue, is that people from different class backgrounds end up in these spaces uh, in Mexico specifically, uh, looking for something, looking for tools to to hack the government, to think about corruption and um, you know how they might respond to uh, structures that they see as unjust, not only with the technology, but with particular set of practices that center turning systems on themselves. Great, great, fantastic, thank you. Um, and we have an, a question in the Q&A from Melanie Bagishauri. She says, uh, thank you so much for this amazing presentation. I would like to ask how to hackathon participators deal with language barriers are most of the participators Spanish speaking or are there are also indigenous language speakers present? Yeah, great question. So that's that's great. I mean, there's always an attempt to, de depend, depending on the organizers, an attempt to include as many people as possible. Again, that's kind of in theory. What happens in practice is another, another story. At least the ones that were in Mexico, they were usually in Spanish. The ones in the US were usually in English. Of course, when you get uh, you know, especially with the Migra hack, where you get people from different backgrounds and um, people who identify as Latinx in one way or another, there's going to be um, a reshuffling of, of what language is spoken, depending on, on who you're interacting with. Um, in terms of indigenous languages specifically, that's a great question. I never saw one hackathon where there was this attempt to um, bring in people who might not speak Spanish or English, which is a big deal, right? Um, thinking about engaging indigenous communities on both sides of the border. Um, there were definitely at least some hackathons that were aimed at these sort of translation issues or language revitalization. So I can think about more than one event where, you know, where the idea was that you'd build an app or some sort of program to help um, to encourage people to use the you know, indigenous languages, you know, usually people from, from these communities. And at one point, you know, the, when the whole gamify thing was was going on, I don't know if that's still a thing in, in these worlds or if that happened a few years ago, but bringing gamifying into systems that would encourage people to use indigenous languages in the name of language revitalization. Great. Um, we have another question from Amba Reyes. She asks, uh, how do you see the tensions and social dynamics between Latinx and Mexicans within hackathons? Yeah, that's a great question. So, all right. So let's see. I want to share something. Let me see. Can I, can I still, if I, if, am I able to share on, on the, on the chat or no? Yes. Not in the chat, but on the share the screen. Yes. The oh, share the screen. Go. Okay. Let me see. Okay. All right. So what I want to share with you is around this time, can you see my my screen here? Yes. Okay. So around so around this time, we were doing um, this was this was in Northern California, UC Berkeley. As a graduate student, um, we formed this Latinos in Tech initiative. And part you might want to look at a policy brief we wrote here. And this question reminds me of oh, so what we did was bring together you know people that we felt weren't talking to each other. So within the university itself. You know, ethnic studies scholars, sociologists, anthropologists, and then there's also the computer science people, which we already saw this, you know, stark division between people thinking about the same issues. But then there was also the other side of the Bay and Silicon Valley, San Francisco, kind of industry. And then there was these other people doing like the community work. So our idea was, hey, you know, as, 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 as boundary crossing anthropologists, let's bring these people together and have a conversation. So we developed a conference, but within, within all of this, we also went to a lot of events that were in some ways aimed at resolving diversity in the tech worlds. And in one conference in particular that really stands in my memory, there was one panel where um, they were talking about racial diversity in, in, in the US within tech spaces within Silicon Valley, very sophisticated language for thinking about racialization and intersectionality. This was one panel. The very next panel, five minutes later, 
is about you know Latin American integration. Um, you know, how do we integrate sort of countries from Latin America into Silicon Valley? Well, guess what? All the language on racialization and class differences seem to disappear. And our question was, well, how, why is this happening? How do we kind of not have that happen? And part of our goal in uh, doing this conference was bringing some of these people together to um, have the conversation and build a, a shared set of vo vocabulary. Anyway, I think that's all a long way to getting at what your question reminded me, Ambar, because in this document, what we ended up with, apart from gathering sort of representative numbers about representation, was productive tensions. What are some of the tensions that arise in these spaces and how do people position themselves on different sides of these uh, you know, core issues and, and tensions? And one of them I remember very clearly is precisely this, right? This Latin Americans versus Latinos or, or, or Latinxes. So there was this kind of lack of um, conversation in terms of shared language for thinking about these issues that we saw happening across um, national lines. But I think your question is about what are the tensions within the hackathons themselves? Um, at least in this Migra Hack event that I presented on, um, well, some of them were in, in Mexico and there was less interaction. You know, there's, there's, we have to consider kind of who, who has the privilege to, to, to travel and wind up in these spaces on either side of the border. So we have to think about class distinctions there. Um, um, thinking about how uh, kind of people wind up in the same space. That was to say, the people that ended up in the same space as part of this migra hack, there wasn't so much of the tension um, that we felt when we did these conferences and we were kind of more broadly exploring these dimensions around the Northern California Silicon Valley area. And I think it's because this hackathon was aimed at a very particular topic, right? Immigration, uh, the US-Mexico border. So people that were there were already kind of on the same page, if that makes sense. I think that was a, like a roundabout answer to, to, to your question, but I just thought about different things that came to my mind. Yeah, that's fantastic and seems like a like a great resource, the, the brief that you shared. So definitely check out that. And there's a question from Divya Duty, Roy, and he, uh, they say, what a, one, what a fabulous talk, Hector. This is Divya from India. Um, how do you see the technological, the socio-technical imaginaries of hackathons uh, can work beyond a techno-positivist uh, paradigm? Unfortunately, in India, hackathons are rather gender and inter intersectionalities of uh, case and class are flattened and repressed. Great. Wow. Okay. That's a, that's definitely a question that will take a long time to think about. Um, so do you see the social technical managers can work beyond a techno positivist paradigm? Fortunately in India, gendered and there's, yeah, I mean, you know, kind of to build on this last, I mean, I think about Christina Dunbar Hester's book, Hacking Diversity, that's really getting at how the hackathon uh, space or hacker space is kind of, you know, in the context of the US, you know, they kind of end up being very white, even if they're aimed at, you know, demystifying and resolving diversity in some way or another. So some examples of, in that book are where, you know, these organizers get together, develop a hackathon to work on issues of diversity, and they look around and everyone in the room is white. Um, and it, and it's, a, it's also, um, framed as a feminist uh, hackathon space, they look around and it's all white women in the room. And across the river or a, a, across the city, I think in, in, in this case, they're in Montreal, there's another conference going on where people are talking about decoloniality. And these events are completely segregated, right? There's all the sort of people of color and people who might have to be in this, or you would want their voices in this feminist space thinking about diversity are at the other event. So the question is like, why is this happening? And I think part of the answer is there just isn't um, sort of a grounded conversation or um, it, it, it's really about the, the, the way social movements come together and really about building social movements and inclusion and allies. I think it has less to do with 
the actual hacking and technology than it has to do with how social movements um, come together, if that makes sense. Dibia. I just want to add that Catherine Ignacio's work uh, is very much in this direction, right? And the set of feminism and hackathons. And all right, there's another question by Marisa Hicks. She asks, uh, how are hackathons such as the Mira Hackathon funded? Yeah, so all types. The the This Mira Hack in particular came out of the work of Claudia Nunez, who had a Knight Fellowship at Stanford sometime in the early um, 2010s, I believe. Um, Again, a different kind of hackathon. Sometimes if it's the more uh, corporate type hackathon, it's funding from Google and these big companies. Sometimes it's sponsored by government entities. It really depends on the feel of the space and who the organizers are. And then we can get into a conversation about, well, how much of who the funding is coming from should determine sort of the... Um, output of, of the hackathon and the type of work people are doing there. So in my other article, the one in the Catalyst Journal, I think about like what else is going on within these spaces in terms of solidarity building and just people finding a space to um, talk to each other. Great. And we have our last question from Nicole Hernandez. They say, it seems like part of a hackathon is about building resiliency and improvisation while working against the clock. But as hackers and coders become more experienced at learning the logics of a hackathon to make the wooden prototype, does the hackathon lose this logic and remaking yourself for accepting systems? Great. Yeah, that's a fantastic um, more comment, right? Like, what are some of the um, logical conclusions of these spaces? Um, if there's a type of learning going on, um, are we sort of surpassing what the actual idea of the hackathon is to come and learn these things? And again, as I mentioned, there's a lot of the time, especially for the ones where there's some sort of prize involved, there's already kind of pre-made teams or people that bring projects that they've already sort of thought about making and it's like almost done. So there's all types of gaming the hackathon. Um, as you're getting at here, Nicole, um, and, and then think, I, I think more complexly thinking about the question, does it lose the, the kind of argument about people remaking themselves when they're learning the logics of how to remake yourself um, is a good question that we need to explore further. All right. And on that note, we have taken advantage of some extra time because we have terrific questions in the Q&A. Uh, so I want to thank Hector for a spectacular presentation, super provocative and, and very, very promising uh, the book project. So congratulations, Hector. Uh, I want to thank Tomas for great uh, introduction and moderation. Everybody in the audience for staying with us uh, through the end. And uh, I invite everybody to join again for for next week's uh, talk of the virtual seminar series of the Center for Latinx Digital Media. Hope uh, all of you have a great uh, rest of your day. If you are already in India, maybe towards the beginning of your next day. Uh, and again, thank you, Hector. Thank you, Tomas.